Hi, this is Bart Polson, and in this video, I'm going to be going over uh, material from the practice final for Behavioral Science 3010. That's Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences at Utah Valley University. In this video, we're going to start with question 34 on the practice final, which begins the section on inferential statistics. The first question in this section 34 is, most data sets in social science studies are from blank. Uh, the answer is from samples. That's A. Uh, almost any time that you have data is going to be from a sample of people. And by the way, in the social sciences, most of those samples are going to be from college students. Um, B, mentally ill people, no. Uh, it, it's actually, I mean, that would be a sample of people, but that's only going to be for studies that are concerned about mentally ill people, which is a smaller number of studies. Uh, C, populations, it's very unusual to be able to get data from a population. In fact, I personally would argue that it's not possible that if you actually have data, it's from a sample. It may be a very large sample, but it's a sample nonetheless. Anyhow, uh, outliers, no. Uh, the only people who would be studying outliers are particular people who are interested, for instance, in uh, exceptional students, meaning uh, people who are either unusually gifted or people with serious cognitive deficits in school. But anyhow, the answer for 34 is A, samples. 35, a sampling distribution of means, okay, um, is, well, it, the answer here is B. It's a distribution of means from many samples. What it is is you take a, uh, a, a population of scores and then you start uh, getting samples of a particular size. It might be two, it might be 20, it might be 2,000, whatever. And you start gathering uh, uh, observations from that population until you have your sample of a particular size. Then you calculate, for instance, the mean um, for that sample. And, and then that mean becomes your uh, new data. And you go through and you do this process truthfully an infinite number of times. Uh, it's not just a, a many samples, it's an infinite number. Um, and what you've done is you've created a, a, a distribution of sample means. Now, technically speaking, it is a population distribution because it's every possible sample mean, but um, that is not a very diagnostic response because there's lots of population distributions that are not sampling distributions. The correct answer is B, a distribution of means from many samples. Now, highly skewed, in fact, uh, no. If your sample is... Um, say over 30, 30 is the general rule of thumb. If you have more than 30 in your samples, almost no matter what the original shape of your distribution, your sampling distribution will be normally distributed. It'll be a bell curve. And a D, always generalizable, I, I you know, that that's just nonsense that's sort of thrown in there. You know, I don't even know what that means here. All right, 36, the sample mean is A or M blank of the population mean. An inflation controlled estimate, now that actually is an advanced statistical concept, but that's not one we're dealing with and we don't talk about it in this class. The sample mean is an overestimate of the population mean? No, it's not an overestimate. Uh, in fact, it's pretty accurate. It's not an underestimate either. In fact, the answer here is D. It is an unbiased point estimate. Now, an estimate means that you have uh, some information about the sample and you're trying to estimate the corresponding thing about the uh, population. So you have a sample mean, you're trying to estimate what the mean is in the population. So that's an estimate. A point estimate means you're giving a single number. Um, you know, like if you're doing the, an election, you would say that 53% of people. Because you're giving a specific number, that's a point estimate. If you said, on the other hand, uh, somewhere between 51 and 56, that's a confidence interval, but that's not what we're doing here. Uh, and unbiased means that it tends to be right on target, and that is true for the mean. Uh, standard deviations and variance, however, that is biased unless you make the degrees of freedom accommodation. So anyhow, for the sample mean, the answer is D. It is an unbiased point estimate of the population mean. All right, 37. According to the central limit theorem, it is safe to assume that given an infinite number of samples, uh, let's see here. The shape of the distribution of the sample means will approximate a normal curve if the sample size used to calculate each mean is greater than or equal to 30. Um, yes, that is correct. A is the correct answer. If your sample sizes are 30 or more, then almost no matter what the original uh, population for the raw scores, the sampling distribution, which is what you're making here, will be a normal distribution. That's one of the things that the central limit theorem says. Uh, B, they'll be skewed. No, that's not true. You can start with skewed, you'll end up with a normal distribution. Uh, it is safe to assume both A and B, th those are contradictory, and uh, D, no, that's, that's, the answer is A, 37A. 
38. In hypothesis testing, if the null hypothesis has been rejected, now the null hypothesis is normally that there is no difference. Um, for instance, there's no difference between groups or there's no correlation between variables. And if you've rejected that because you have evidence that is sufficient to say that that is probably not the case, then what hypothesis do we assume? In other words, what's the other hypothesis called? The advanced hypothesis? No. Uh, the alternative hypothesis? Yes, that is the correct answer. It's also called the, if you're doing an experiment, sometimes they call it an experimental hypothesis, and they can uh, call it H1 for hypothesis 1 because the null is known as HO, or they can call it HA for alternative hypothesis. The dissimilar hypothesis and the modern hypothesis, that's just made up nonsense. Ignore those. 39. In hypothesis testing, if the critical value is less extreme than the observed value, i.e. the test value, okay, this is confusing. The critical value, so for instance, if you're doing a z-test, the critical value is going to be plus or minus 1.96. So if your sample has a z-score greater than plus 1.96 or uh, more negative than minus 1.96, um, then you reject the null hypothesis. So if the critical value is less extreme than the observed value, put another way, the observed value is more extreme. So your sample has a z-score of plus 3. Um, that makes them more extreme than the cutoff of plus 1.96. Then, A, the null hypothesis is rejected. That is the correct answer. You reject the null hypothesis. Now, please note, B, C, and D here. The null hypothesis is important. No, just because there's a low probability of getting your observations by chance doesn't mean it's important. That depends on uh, the context and how big the effect is and a number of other things. The null hypothesis is true. Well, you just rejected it, so it's probably not true. Um, although, truthfully, you can't say for sure whether it's true or false. You're just saying that it's unlikely, or these data are unlikely given a true null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis retained? No, you just rejected it. You got rid of it. So A is the correct answer for 39. 40. Which of the following is always true for statistically significant results? Uh, the results are important? No, not necessarily. It could be trivial, and if you have a large sample, the difference could be very small. The p-value is higher than the alpha. Now, the alpha is the proportion of the distribution that you set aside as being unusually uh, high or low. That's usually 5%. It's written as 05. If the p-value is higher, that would mean a bigger number, so 0.1 or 0.07, uh, you would not reject the null hypothesis. That would not be statistically significant. Uh, so it's not B. C, the null hypothesis is not rejected. Well, if it's statistically significant, you rejected it. So it's not C. So it must be D, none of the above. All right, 41. Which of the following statements below is inappropriate when discussing results of statistical significance tests? Let's see here. The null hypothesis has been proven true. Um, yeah, you can't prove the null hypothesis is true. Uh, A is correct. You, you, you can't prove that it's not true. It's You can say that the data are likely or, or have a relatively higher or lower probability if the null hypothesis is true, but you, you can't say that it has been proven true. Uh, on the other let's see, B, that the null hypothesis has been rejected. You can reject the null hypothesis. You can say that given our sample data, we see this is unlikely, so you reject it. C, that the null hypothesis has been retained. Yeah, you can say that if, you, if your uh, sample value wasn't very extreme. And then all of the above. Um, no, the only one that's inappropriate always is A, because you just can't prove that the null is true. You can simply say that you reject it because given your sample data, it's not likely. Um, so that's what we're going to do. 42, what would be the advantage of increasing N, that's the sample size, in null hypothesis significance testing? Uh, okay, our choices are Cohen's D would be greater. Cohen's D is the standardized effect size, and it's used to indicate the difference between means, either one mean, for, sample mean from a population mean, or two sample means from each other. Uh, the sample size has nothing to do with that. In fact, Cohen's D specifically ignores the sample size, so that is not A. It would make conducting a one-tailed test easier. Well, that has nothing to do with anything. The sample size is irrelevant for that. C, the null hypothesis would be more likely to be rejected. That is true. Because when you have a large sample, you have a much smaller standard error, which means that a smaller difference between the means can become statistically significant. So, again, bigger samples, more likely to get statistical significance. So C is true. D, the range of scores would be easier to manage. That, that's just that's nonsense. Ignore that. So the answer for 42 is C. The null hypothesis would be more likely to be rejected.
Okay, then we have a question split across a big gap here. 43, p-values are uh, A, influenced by sample sizes. That's true. Um, you can take the same effect size, and if you have a big sample size, it's more. it'll have a smaller p-value. It'll be more likely to be statistically significant. P-values are B, usually the same value as effect sizes. No, they're different, uh, in part because they take into consideration the uh, sample sizes. P-values are C, always greater than 1. No, they're never greater than 1. They go from 0 up to a maximum of 1, but they're never greater. And D, the same as alpha values. No, the alpha value is a criterion, the, the baseline they use for comparing things. The P-value shifts around, the alpha value stays put. So the answer for 43 is A. P-values are influenced by sample size. That's the probability of a particular sample's result. 44. Which of the following is an impossible value for both P and alpha? 05 is possible. 01 is possible. 0.5 is possible. Because these numbers go from 0 to 1. Um, so, sort of by elimination, it must be D. D, 0, 0. 0, 0, or really, if you mean 0 all the way, it means that there's 0 probability of this or that. And that, that just doesn't happen in statistics. And so, D is the answer. Um, I'm going to stop there, take a little break, and we'll rejoin in the next video.